Don't get nervous now. You don't get nervous. No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few different questions than you had last night. That's fine. Um, I guess I'm going to start with, uh, this is your first June not in a camp in the CFL since when? Well, my first camp was in 1972. And if you consider going back to college, uh, I was at training camp in, in Idaho in 1968. So this is probably since 1968, the first time I've not been in a, a two-a-day uh, type of situation. So how's it feel? Well, you know what, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, you know, the thing that I'm realizing is that, uh, you know, retirement is not a punishment. You know, it, it, it's really a, a change of, uh, uh, of priorities and a change of lifestyles. And, uh, you know, uh, it's something that I chose to do because I wanted to do it. Uh, you know, I've reaped the benefits of it uh, at this point, but... Uh, you know, it's like somebody says, you know, retirement is about retraining your lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to find uh, uh, that. And, uh, you know, it's like anything. You have to experience something at least once before you know how to deal with it and how to improve it. Well, maybe it's important for CFL fans to know. My friends with the Lions said, you were, re you were ready for this. So to get on with the next phase. Are they right in saying that? But you're at peace with this decision. <laughs> well, no, I, I am because, you know, if I wanted to, I was, I'm hoping that I could still get a job somewhere else. And, uh, you know, it's a good example is, you know, when I look at what I've done uh, in the five, six months, uh, you know, I spent a lot more time with my family, uh, a lot more time with my children and grandchildren. Uh, you know, we just got back from uh, four days in, in Disneyland with my third grandson and... Uh, uh, just got back from Seattle where we allowed my daughter and her husband to get away for five days so we babysat the three kids and uh, you know uh, yesterday we were at the, the great function you know I wouldn't have been able to do that uh, you know if I was uh, you know occupied with coaching. Has your mind been in Kamloops at all? Has it wandered to? You know what uh, I'd like to stay abreast of what's going on I'd like to you know kind of flip through the uh, uh, the news, but uh, you know, after that, uh, you know, I feel it's time for somebody else to have that opportunity. You know, I was uh, given that opportunity. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, do I still have an interest in the CFL? Yes. I, you know, I was really happy to see the, uh, you know, the uh, board of governors and the, uh, you know, the PA come to a resolution. I think it was a very good and fair resolution for both sides. You know, when you've been a part of something for forty-six years, you just don't automatically severed ties, right? But I, I think the interest is uh, normal, um, you know, and uh, I'm going to be excited to be a fan, not right. a participant, right? So 254 career wins, correct? Number one all time? <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> you say, I'm sure you're not big on numbers. No, I, I can't remember. I'm not that smart anymore. Uh, I would ask you, What's your secret to be the number one winningest coach in CFL history? What would be your number one secret? Well, I think obviously longevity has a big part to play in it. Uh, you, know, um, you know, you don't win as many games uh, like that and you don't have the time because it takes time to win uh, a lot of games. Uh, you know, but with that, uh, you know, for you to get time, you have to also be successful, as you said, right? You know, there's a number of things, you know, one, I, I, I think you have to be surrounded by people that uh, want to see you succeed. I think you have to be surrounded by people that uh, will complement uh, your strengths. Um, you know, you got to have organizations that believe and give you the latitude uh, to do things your way, which, you know, I've always had. Um, you know, you got to have great quarterbacks, uh, which I've had. You've had, you had to have great players. You know, and you look at uh, from 1990 to 2018, uh, you know, we've had some great, great players. And, uh, um, you know, as coaches, our responsibility is to do whatever we can to put them in the best position. Uh, then you got to find the guys that can go out and win for you. And, uh, you know, so we've been able to do that, uh, you know, over my years. Uh, uh, I said we've had great coaches. We've had great players. We've had great uh, personnel people. I mean, some of the best personnel people uh, I've been very fortunate to work with, Roy Shivers. Uh, you know, Roy is a legend in his own mind. Uh, 
And in ours too. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> you know, and then we had Bobo Bilovich, who was also uh, another, uh, you know, icon in, in the CFL. And, you know, between those two guys, they were with me, f uh, you know, for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, they brought always some great players that, uh, you know, eventually made the Nicholas uh, different and even better. Great players make great coaches, sure, for sure. But just on the philosophical end, I mean, Christy mentioned integrity the other night. Um, did you evolve your philosophy over your time? I mean, I've been around you for 20 years in what I do. I didn't see a huge change in you through that time. What did you learn in your 46 years? Did you evolve running team? Well, you know, I, I evolved in, in uh, you know, in how, uh, you know, I would run practice or how I would, uh, you know, uh, build your team. Uh, you know, all the things, the strategic part you evolve. I, I, don't, I don't think you change uh, your beliefs, you know, the, as I've always said, if if your beliefs are good when you're winning, they should also be good when you're losing. Uh, you know, you 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 uh, you know, you can say what you want, but at the end of the day, it's easier to live uh, a life that you've uh, you know that you really truly uh, think is 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 good. And uh, you know, I've always believed about being honest and. Uh, you know, I've always believed about being tough because football is a tough game, and uh, I've always believed that you got to push the players and the coaches and the organization sometimes beyond uh, their own little comfort zone. And uh, you know, with that, uh, you know, sometimes you rub people the wrong way, which is fine too. Like, you know, that's all part of uh, a job. And uh, you know, as I said, my job isn't to be liked; my job is to win. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you can win with integrity, you can win with honesty, and uh, you definitely will win with good men. Have players evolved? Have they changed? Well, I think you know, players have changed uh, not because players have changed; it's because players, uh, you know, and you look at. You know, I've been in football since the, the early early seventies. Society's changed. Uh, how we uh, view things, how we raise our children, uh, what we expect from our children has changed. As I said, uh, you know, uh, last night at the function, you know, if your father treated you a certain way today, you know, they would say that was abuse. You know, to, yeah, then it was discipline. Then it was just the way life was, right? So, you know, uh, young men have changed. Why? Because, uh, you know, the society around them, the environment around them has changed. Expectations have changed. Uh, how they've been brought up has changed. Uh, you know, I have six uh, grandchildren, and I asked my two daughters, um, do you guys ever not negotiate with your kids? You know, so it's, you know, it's, and in, in today's world, coaching is as much about negotiating and it's about, uh, you know, getting them to believe your message. Whereas at one time, coach said something, you did it. It wasn't, you know, it's, it's, so it's, as simple as that is, uh, you know, it, it, it's quite true. That's why I asked. You had to tweet your message at some point, I would think. Well, I'm I did. This is why. You know, my good friend, Dr. Frank Lodato, who's a sports psychologist with me for years and years and years and years, you know, we changed how we approach the players, how we approach the leadership, how we approach running the football club. And, you know, Dr. Frank would always uh, talk to me about, uh, you know, getting the players input, getting the leadership group to, uh, you know, lobby uh, for the players, to lobby to the coaches, uh, because, you know, sports, the young men have changed and uh, the more input you gave them, the more say you gave them, you know, the, the more um, invested they felt and they would be. And, you know, so uh, at times it's difficult because, uh, you know, players aren't always the most mature guys in the world and to, you know, rely on them for direction, uh, you know, but when you do, you reap the benefits of it. What do you love the most about the CFL? Well, you know, I, I think there's a lot to love about the CFL. Uh, you know, I think the, the thing I've always said is the CFL is a league of opportunity. Uh, it gives a lot of people opportunities to grow uh, themselves to uh, better their life. You know, whether it's a coach, whether it's a player, whether it's an administrator, whether uh, it's a secretary, uh, you know, whether it's anybody. You know, the CFL gives uh, people opportunities that maybe wouldn't have been there. And uh, when you look at how the CFL has helped 
uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people better themselves. Uh, it's, I think it's made this country better. Uh, I know I can remember when I lived in Montreal uh, in 1970, and uh, they were going through all that political uh, uh, crisis, and it was quite dangerous. Uh, you know, the thing that brought the city and the province together was the Alouettes winning the Grey Cup and them having uh, the Grey Cup parade in downtown Montreal. You know, so when you look at uh, events in history like that and you say the effect the CFL has had, uh, you know, it's way more, I think, at times than people give it credit. Do you think you'll be advised moving forward, not just on the football side, but on this kind of thing? You, you don't just have a national view, you have a world view. You're born in Italy, right? Mm -hmm. Like. I hope they consult you. I mean, what's it going to take in these major centers to trigger that love for the CFL? Because you've lived in those centers and you spent... Well, I, I spoke a little bit about that last night, about the fact that, uh, you know, the CFL... And, and you know what? you got to give the commissioner, uh, Randy Ambrosi, a lot of credit for his, you know, 2.0 um, uh, process. we got to make our game global. We cannot stay within our own boundaries and believe that we're going to... Uh, uh, prosper, we were not. A and you look at it right now, uh, you know, the world has become uh, so open that if you want to stay isolated and enclosed, you you're killing yourself. And unfortunately, the CFL uh, has done that. We've never uh, gotten outside of our borders. We never got outside of our own little uh, network. And I think it's hurt us because uh, you know, the product on the field that the players, the coaches, the support staff put on is a tremendous product. Um, you know, it's entertaining. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, can we sell it to, uh, to the world? Yes. But we have to have uh, ways to get it out there to them. And, you know, uh, like every other uh, major league, one way to do it is to open uh, access to your teams to other to world players. Uh, you know, you look at what happened in basketball with... Uh, the big Chinese fella. Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah. You know, now uh, the NBA has a tremendous, tremendous audience in China. Well, I wonder how much money they make off that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you look at the NFL and their global perspective about getting into Mexico, into Europe. You know, you look at uh, Major League Baseball, where all their players, and hockey. You look at where hockey's coming. You know, you look at how big the NHL's gotten. And it's because, again, uh, they've expanded their borders outside of their own country. Are you optimistic about the future of the CFL? Well, I, I am more so today than I was, say, five years ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, with the commissioner and uh, his vision. You know, the, the thing is, it's, uh, you've got to have leadership. Le leadership has to be willing to put their neck on the line for change. And believe me, change, uh, especially in the CFL, uh, is difficult. Change within our own country is very difficult. And, you know, so God bless Randy for uh, putting uh, his neck on the line for his vision uh, because, again, you know, we might not see the, the benefits of it, but I believe in time somebody will see the benefit of it. You like him a lot, don't you? Well, I, I like him a lot because, you know, one, uh, he's played. Two, he's been, been involved in the process you know, when he was with the PA. Uh, secondly, he's done very, very well in the business community. Third, you know, he, when you look at it, you know, he is a natural leader. And, uh, you know, he thinks outside the box. And, uh, you know, at the end of it, uh, you know, I don't know how old Randy is, but, you know, he's everywhere all the time uh, selling and promoting the league. But he's just not selling and promoting the league in Canada, he's also looking outside, and uh, if he can get off and get going what he thinks he can, you know, then the, the, the revenues will come in, and then the players will be better compensated for, and they should be. Uh, the risk that players take for what they get paid is, in some ways, a little tragic. I should ask you, because you're a career coach, the coach, on the coaching salary cap and staff limitation. doesn't affect you anymore. Um, how did you I'm feel? I'm glad it doesn't. <laughs> that was my question. How do you feel about that? It's not too popular with my friends. Well, you know what? I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm going to say this. I predict this is five, six years ago. Okay, you know, maybe even uh, sooner than that because, you know, it's, it's relative. When you run a business and you cannot cap 
just one segment of your business. And unfortunately, we did cap the players, or fortunately, because we had to uh, keep costs under control. But then when football operations costs started getting out of control, which they did, you know, then the league uh, probably uh, got pressure from uh, themselves, but also from the PA saying, you know, uh, you've capped us. The other aspect that's uh, running out of control is the football operations. So, you know, uh, at the end of it, you got to be able to stay within your budgets. And, uh, you know, I don't blame the league. I don't blame the governors. Uh, because I would have done that uh, sooner, uh, you got to keep your costs under control. And it's not the rich clubs uh, that you're worried about. It's the clubs that are, uh, their bottom lines are either break even or slightly in the red. Uh, you know, costs go up, uh, you know, losses go up. And eventually, uh, people are going to stop wanting to uh, pay for losses, and then the leak becomes even more in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. The only last couple of questions I have for you is you said the best player, the best quarterback you have is Doug Flutie. I assume that, that would count as the best player you ever coached. Maybe he's even played in this league. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, all, I'm a Doug Flutie fan, okay? Right. <laughs> and not that I don't love, you know, the Cam Wakes and the Dave Dickinson and the Jeff Garcias and the Henry Burses, because, you know, they, and G.R. Simons and Alan Pitts. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And Brent Johnson's. And I mean, there's been, uh, you know, Jason Claremont. There's been a lot of unbelievable football players, but you know when you look at a guy uh, that uh, you know was in BC, was a tremendous player, and made everybody in BC better. Uh, he even made Bob Bilovich better, right? <laughs> you know, then he came to Calgary, and you know what he did for us and what he did for me was unbelievable. You know, then he turns around and goes to Toronto, and uh, you know does the same thing. So you know, I mean. Uh, when you look at that one individual and what he did for those three organizations, uh, you have to say that it's more than just his ability to play quarterback. You know, it, it was his persona. It was his, uh, uh, you know, just his whole aura about Doug. When Doug came to your organization, it was almost guaranteed to win. And, you know, it, it's proven that way. And, you know, the guy at this point who's like that is Bo Levi Mitchell. You know, Calgary, they probably were sweating in the uh, free agent period, uh, not knowing what he was going to do. And, you know, and uh, Bo, God bless him, uh, is a winner. Uh, he's won everywhere he's been. Uh, ever since he's been a starter for the Stampeders, his win-loss is unbelievable. Because, you know, football is about winning. Quarterback is measured by two things, winning and winning championships. And if I'm not mistaken, he's at two. And I would imagine he'll get one or two more. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess lastly, just for Ryder fans, you know they've had a love-hate relationship with you. Love to hate probably, yet they respect you. In the room, they wanted to get the wall, they chant going, and people didn't want to do it because they respect <laughs> you so much. Um, what is your thoughts on this place? You've coached so many games. There's so many memorable games, right? The playoffs always come to mind. But. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, playoffs are good and bad. I mean, I remember the uh, 95 Great Cup. Uh, you know, we played the Baltimore Stallions, and I can remember uh, uh, they almost had to cancel the game because of the wind. You know, and then I remember the, uh, the, the Regina wind got us because, you know, we couldn't punt the ball on the side. We kept on punting in the middle, and uh, the returner had, I think, two touchdowns that game. And the one thing Doug hated the mo more than anything wasn't the cold, it was the wind. You know, so it, everything was, um, was negative that way. But... You know, the thing about when you came to Saskatchewan, when you came to Regina, it didn't matter always about the team. Because, you know, the quality of the team didn't always determine uh, how tough the game was going to be. Okay, the quality uh, of, of the atmosphere usually was the... And I can remember uh, always walking around and when the stands started to fill up, and if the bleachers started to fill up, I got a little bit nervous because I knew the more people were in there, the louder it would be, the harder it would be for us to be able to do what we wanted to do. So, you know, that, that, that's got to do with the fans, and that's got to do with the people of uh, Saskatchewan that came to support their football club. And I, I, I know I've never coached here, and I'm probably disappointed that I didn't, but, uh, you know, they were very passionate about their team, and uh, whether it was a 12-win team or a 3-win team, 
the fans in some ways were always uh, very supportive and you know very tough on visiting teams yeah well i'm gonna miss you wally and but i appreciate this and thanks for all you've done oh yeah appreciate it all right it's been fun